Hello, uh, it's uh, Henry Shelford here from Sarcodosis UK, uh, and I'm thrilled to, well, thrilled to be here as ever, but particularly thrilled that we're going to be joined today uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Simon Hart, who's an old friend of Sarcodosis UK, and we've uh, uh, done um, uh, two pieces of research together, uh, which uh, no doubt we're going to talk about. Uh, there's been a lot of interest uh, um, online with a lot of questions submitted, uh, so we've got, um, uh, and if you have any further questions, just drop them into the comments. Uh, and we will uh, try to ask them. Some of them you might find are being asked uh, anyway, um, but we're, we're here. And so we're, we're live on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter all at the same time. Uh, and uh, so, but we will be putting questions in from uh, from both Twitter and Facebook. So, uh, and uh, I'm very excited to be here. So with, well, without further ado, um, let's say hello to Simon. Hello, hello Henry. Thank you for inviting me. Pleasure, Pleasure to be here. here. Well, we are, look, we're very excited. We know you're very, you're a very eminent person. Your time is enormously valuable. So thank you very, very much. We've got you till three. You've given us an hour, which is very generous and, and appreciated. Thank you. Now I'm going to, I'm going to remind everyone of, uh, of your, 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 well, what you're up to and your credentials. So, um, and uh, I think the summary that Dr. Hart is particularly interesting because he is both uh, in um, a researcher um, specialist as well as a consultant physician. So he is a, a reader in respiratory medicine at Hull York Med Medical School. And his clinical role is that as a consultant physician at Hull University um, uh, NHS Trust. And um, what's a reader? That doesn't, you don't go to the library the whole time and just look at, yeah. look at books. Do you, like, in, the, people in, might like in, in, in the States or in Europe, they, that would be uh, something like an associate professor. Okay. Which is which is a yeah, which is a very serious thing. And um, um, so, do you know the history of why it's called a reader? No, are you going to? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm here without the information. We're... <laughs> no, we'll look it up and tell people later. <laughs> that's, that's one for us. Do the um, questions get easier after this? They do. They do. They do get easier. Well, they're never yeah. hard. You look like, your bountiful knowledge. We took you off uh, off topic into general academia there, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, I suppose, look, the first question is, um, how is it going? Like, how is everything? You've gone, and, and how was it that the, you had the peak preparation for um, COVID cases? And yeah, I mean, it's nice to be getting back to something like normal in terms of the normal clinical services that we provide, especially for the large number of people that we see as outpatients in our, in our hospital outpatient clinic. Uh, during the, the peak of the COVID surge, uh, we, we were basically all redeployed to full-time inpatient COVID-related work. Uh, luckily, that surge is over and we're getting back to normal again. Of course, we, we've got the concern about second wave and how we're going to cope with that and how the hospitals are going to be affected by that as well. And there's, so there's planning involved in that. Uh, but it is nice to be getting back to something like normal. But of course, um, a lot of routine care was put on hold for many months and there's, therefore there's a huge backlog and I'm sure uh, people in the audience today who, who are patients who are, or, or uh, who are friends or carers of patients will realise that um, uh, that it can be difficult uh, getting to see your hospital specialist because of the backlog that has accumulated. And. Um... Uh, I disappeared for a second there. Um, how's your clinic been affected? Yeah, well, um, our sarcoidosis outpatient service was put on hold along with all other non-COVID work uh, for about four months, uh, from March until July or so. Um, and even in that you know, relatively short period of time, uh, that's a lot of work paused and therefore a big backlog to try and uh, catch, catch up uh, with people who haven't been seen or, or should have been seen, as well as um, trying to manage the uh, the continual uh, referrals we get in as well. So it's a challenge. And have you seen? So have you, have you seen? You're, are you getting the referrals you're expecting? So you, you've said you've been dealing with the backlog, uh, and uh, and now and as well as having to deal with the stuff coming in. Are you seeing the sarcoidosis patients you would normally yes. get coming forward? Yes. So, the, so certainly, uh, my experience is that the refer the the referrals in from general practice and from other hospital specialists 
um, are seem to be back to uh, somewhere near what they should be, I think. And how, how does it, um, you know, one of the main reasons people come forward is a persistent cough. Do you think, so do you think COVID has made people more aware that they should go yeah. to someone if they've got a persistent cough or, or well, more worried to go forward? Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, people, as you quite rightly say, some people with sarcoidosis have a persistent cough. Many patients with other respiratory diseases have a persistent cough. Some people can have a persistent cough uh, without any lung disease due to oversensitivity of the normal cough reflex. That's a, that's a common problem. And it's, uh, there's a concern that cough can be stigmatized in the COVID era um, because of its uh, association with COVID symptoms. So, so it's, it's, it's difficult for people with a cough, absolutely. And that's a very good time for me to remind everyone that we have badges <laughs> that we sell that raise good funds for the charity, which would say, I think my cough is not contagious. Uh, it's uh, uh, um, it's sarcoidosis, not coronavirus, uh, and um, we also have one for people who are unable to wear masks, uh, as well as as well as masks. And actually, these, they're they're quite a big deal in uh, helping us raise funds right now. So thank you for raising that point to allow me to, <laughs> to, to say that. Um, so we talked, well, we're just touching on COVID. So what what's your view on long COVID and the impact on people with sarcoidosis? So um, a couple of aspects about long COVID. One is the potential for people who've had severe COVID pneumonia, usually in hospital, possibly in intensive care, uh, to be left with some, uh, uh, some long-standing lung damage, which may or may not improve with time. It's too early really for us to say whether people uh, like that are gonna improve over time or are gonna be left with permanently damaged lungs or may even have something progressive. And then there are people who don't have so much of the lung problems but have other problems post COVID like um, uh, fluctuating fevers or fatigue um, and a, a kind of a bit like, like an autoimmune uh, disease, uh, but where the nature of that autoimmunity uh, can't be can't be focused really, and 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 it may be that COVID in some people triggers a a kind of spectrum of autoimmune type symptoms that can go on. Again, it's very early stages. We're you know we're um, you know we're just um, seeing some of these cases, and uh, only time will tell, and only experience will tell uh, how people do in the longer term, and and whether there are any effective treatments. Certainly, um, I um, so I I thought I had COVID some time ago in sort of January February time and uh, and I, well, partly because I live in Chinatown, <laughs> so uh, I was uh, um, early doors and um, I, or the and so I was before when I could have got any tests to confirm it. So I don't know, but I certainly for the next two months had much more fatigue, had shortness mm -hmm. of breath to the extent that I got referred for a. An MRI and uh, uh, and uh, and that's then receded, but it does make me think that someone who's already got so with sarcoidosis fatigue is common, shortness of breath is common. So to have that on top um, could be very very troubling and very difficult. If 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 you have a pre-existing uh, chronic condition, uh, especially affecting the lungs like sarcoidosis. Uh, then, yeah, it, then people are going to be likely to run into more trouble if they have something on top of that, uh, like a COVID infection, for example. I think, you know, look at, related to one of the questions from a bit, a bit later on, uh, Henry, about um, whether we've been seeing a lot of that. I think fortunately not, in my experience. Now, that may be because um, uh, people have been shielding or uh, following the government's advice about minimising infection risk very fastidiously. Um, or it might be despite that, um, uh, we don't really know. But fortunately, we've not seen, our clinical experience has not been of a lot of people with sarcoidosis coming down with COVID. And that's, a, so yeah, you were looking, referring to a question, which is how, how is the virus affecting people with sarcoidosis and is the fertility, fertility, fatality rate higher amongst sarcoidosis sufferers uh, who contract the virus? And, yeah, so we like the experiences. We haven't seen a lot of that in terms of fatality rates for COVID in people with sarcoidosis compared with 
fatality rates for COVID in people without sarcoidosis, I have not seen any data uh, that would allow us to make a conclusion about that. I don't think those data are out there or I don't think they've been looked at, as far, not to my knowledge. Yeah, I know. I mean, that's a, one of the challenges of being a rare, a rare condition, right? That there aren't, yeah. you know, although there are a chunk of us, there aren't that many comparatively. And, uh, yeah. um, um, but it is though, I think, incidentally, though, you'd expect to have noticed um, something within your patient cohort if there was something drastically happening right now. Um, I, I, I think you're right. We, we, we would have done if there was a big uh, predisposition, predisposition amongst people with sarcoidosis and, and generally we've not seen that, fortunately. Which is, which is very, very yeah. good and important, but the, the data is building and that's we'll, we, we learn, learn more. No, about you're absolutely right. These, these data, people are looking at these data and collecting these data continuously. So we will continue to learn uh, about the effect of COVID in, in other conditions as time goes by. Now, someone asked a much more optimistic question, which is yeah. always nice, which is, will the advance, advances in treatment of, uh, the, of the virus, of, of COVID-19, make much difference to help sarcoidosis um, sufferers were we to catch it and with sarcoidosis generally? Because obviously things like, for, you know, long COVID, fatigue, fatigue is something we yeah. call sarcoidosis. So do, do we have any sort of, is there a little upside here? Amongst all well, this, all this I think... Generally, of course, I mean, COVID has been remarkable in that we've learned so much more about this infection and its treatment in such a very short space of time, you know, four months, six months, compared with other comparable viral infections, influenza, for example, over years, decades and, and centuries. Uh, it, it really is quite incredible the amount of uh, effort uh, that's been put in uh, to understanding this disease and its better treatment. And uh, you know, many people will have heard about the number of clinical trials that have been performed, some showing negative results, but we do have some interventions um, uh, which are beneficial for certain people with COVID at certain stages of the disease. So the, the, the things, the, the interventions that the trials have, have shown to be beneficial in certain people are the steroid dexamethasone, the antiviral drug remdesivir, uh, and the inhaled immune stimulatory uh, drug interferon 1b. So uh, we have now kind of three uh, uh, arms there to, uh, to treat uh, selected people with, with COVID. And that's, you know, that's fantastic to discover that in such a short period of time. Um, fatigue though remains a very difficult symptom to treat, uh, be it in sarcoidosis or, or whether it's related to other conditions It's very, a common uh, problem in sarcoidosis and I don't think we're any further forward with the fatigue. Um, uh, what one would hope though is that indirectly um, our understanding of the, of, of the COVID infection, the immune response to it and how that can be modulated therapeutically uh, will be helpful for other inflammatory, auto-inflammatory or, or immune related diseases in the longer term. And that would include, I would include sarcoidosis in that category. So indirectly, I hope it will be of benefit, but not directly uh, to sarcoidosis at the moment. But you know, the way research goes, um, uh, it, it's not uncommon for um, our understanding to be improved or, or beneficial treatment effects to become apparent as a, as a spin-off of something else or by chance, if you like. So you're absolutely right to pose that question in that way, uh, but I hope so. Good, and it's, yeah, it's particularly nice, I think, we're all very, um, yeah, it's nice to have an idea of something positive that might might happen. Yeah. Um, we had um, a few mm -hmm. questions just around living with, um, with the virus and sarcoidosis. And uh, we had one question from uh, Alice over email, just saying like with so many people back to normal life, what can we do to protect ourselves? And I'm in, I'm in London in Chinatown and I like it's, it's, at some points it, it can feel very careless, the people around, around, around me. There, there's a lot of, some of the hustle and bustle is back. And, uh, and we, we had questions previously, someone talking about that they worked in a shop and people you know, weren't wearing their mask and, and they were considering giving up their their job. So they, 
it is a it is a, a tough balance so what what do you think people should be doing right now yeah so you're absolutely right a, a bit of it is the understanding of the situation this this is what we are seeing is the evolution of a viral pandemic um, we should not and would not expect the virus to have gone away at this stage um, the initial measures that were put in place uh, by governments were, try, were, were an attempt to reduce the number of deaths and to prevent hospital services from becoming overwhelmed. Um, and, but, but to expect the virus to go away with any measures uh, is just not what's going to happen. We are, for the moment, until there is an effective mass vaccination program, which may be some time away, for the moment, we are going to have to learn to live with it. And that's going to mean that there will be a certain certain degree of risk for anybody and everybody. And in deciding what what you're going to do um, as a patient or a person uh, in that situation, it's very much a personal decision, um, a, a weighing up of the risks to you, depending on what you do for um, work and leisure, um, your own medical condition and how much um, how, how much vulnerability uh, you may have should you contract the virus. And that's all about uh, how much reserve your body has to cope uh, with a viral infection like COVID, uh, how much risk you are willing to take uh, personally and getting your own personal balance right between risk, of which there is some for anybody, uh, against the downsides of shielding or extreme social isolation and all the negative effects of that, both both on physical health in terms of lack of exercise, in terms of mental health, in terms of ability to work, finances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is no one size fits all. It is a personal decision weighing up uh, these different aspects. Um, the British Thoracic Society, which is um, the society responsible in the UK for for respiratory health. Um, has provided some quite, I think, quite useful and insightful guidance on this on its website, which basically explains those factors about it being a personal decision, weighing up individual factors when deciding um, how, how, you know, how isolated you should be or uh, what you're going to do in your daily life. Um, it is very much a personal decision and weighing up the, the risks or potential risks. Now, that feeds very well into the question, uh, the, the next question, which is, are we all still um, uh, extremely clinical, clinically vulnerable, ECV, or should some of us be in a lower uh, category of yeah, vulnerability? Yeah, and that's really related to the same topic, isn't it? No, it was convenient to have a blanket, extremely clinically vulnerable um, uh, you know, allocation in terms of shielding. Uh, but of course, there isn't a one size fits all at all, and it, it, there, there is a, a, you know, a, a, a gradation of different levels of vulnerability, and, and you know, it's that's something for people to try and work out themselves with advice from their clinician. I, I've had many patients contacting me, uh, uh, you know, really asking me to support their position and what they decide to do, which 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 I've been happy to do. Um, so. You know, um, it, in terms of your vulnerability, especially when it comes to respiratory health and sarcoidosis commonly affects the lungs and the COVID virus uh, is typically causes a pneumonia, which is a lung infection and inflammation. It can affect other parts of the body as well, uh, but its most dangerous aspect is the pneumonia. So, so, so vulnerability there comes down really to how badly your lungs are affected as a sarcoidosis patient because if you have mild or no lung involvement then you're probably not vulnerable because you've got healthy lungs like a normal healthy person but if you've got very damaged lungs um, then you have less reserve or less capability to cope with a pneumonia caused by covid and therefore are more likely to come to harm or to potentially die from from covid pneumonia should you catch it so it's really down to the level of lung impairment that, that an individual person has. And as clinicians, we would assess that with um, seeing how, how breathless people are on a day-to-day -day basis, 
what their chest x-ray looks like in terms of how much lung disease there is and as uh, something you can actually quantitate what a person's lung function test results are. Um, breathing tests that many people will have undergone actually give some figures, some numbers that you can read off uh, that compare your results against what we would predict for someone of your age and size um, and, and give it as a percentage value. So these are all things that can be uh, put into the mix when making, when making those decisions. Um, there is another aspect, of course, about uh, immunosuppressive treatment. So people who take steroids or other immunosuppressive drugs, as some people may do for sarcoidosis, are potentially at increased risk because, of course, those drugs deliberately suppress the immune response. And if you have a viral infection, you need an immune response in order to fight the virus. Uh, a bit like your previous question, Henry, um, have we seen people come to harm from COVID who are taking immune suppressive drugs, either for sarcoid or for uh, other conditions, or rheumatoid arthritis, for example? And the answer is fortunately not. And again, this may be because people have been shielding and uh, strictly uh, self-isolating, or it may be despite that, people are just not coming to harm if you're, if you're taking these medications. It doesn't really affect the virus. We don't know which of those scenarios is true, but again, fortunately, it's not been a big uh, problem that we've seen in clinical practice. And um, Claire, is actually um, uh, on Facebook, has asked a question which, which feeds into that, which is, um, if we're not on medication, are we still at risk? Yeah, the, uh, again, I would, uh, I would uh, really assess that simply by how bad you, badly your lungs are affected with sarcoidosis. Mild or no lung involvement, not really at increased risk. You know, bad lung involvement, then yes, uh, much less reserved to tackle a COVID pneumonia should you be unlikely enough to get it. Um, uh, and therefore you would be regarded as uh, extremely clinically vulnerable. Yeah, and I think one of the things to say is because of the way sarcoidosis can flare up, people's level of medication can change. And that can be at quite a different, the medication rate can be quite a different rate to the level of damage in their lungs. So they might find yeah. themselves quite stable with a very low or, or, or no medication dose, but actually still have very damaged lungs. So yes. them at risk of COVID. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, as I've said, uh, some, many of my patients have contacted me for discussions and advice about this. Um, but, and, and that's fine, I, um, you know, I, I think there's something that your, your clinician would be happy to discuss with you. Of course, the paradox has been that during the COVID shutdown, it's been very difficult uh, for people to see or speak to their, their specialist. And yeah. um, so, you know, it's trying to, how to balance those things, it's uh, difficult. And also very clearly, a respiratory specialist is somewhat in demand. Um, yeah, indeed. Uh, um, at that moment. Um, Actually, on medication, but slightly differently, um, Cardenas on Facebook has asked, um, and I'm going to add a, a bit to it as, as well, like, which is, should people with sarcoidosis take more vitamin D3 and um, K2 uh, um, and, and calcium in light of COVID, especially for, uh, they've asked about um, uh, BAME patients? Um, so my, vitamin D, my, K2, uh, my initial response to the question about vitamin D is no, Henry. And, and um, my, the reason for that is you have to be careful with vitamin D if you're a sarcoidosis patient because you, sarcoidosis people have, uh, are at risk of overproducing the active form of vitamin D. Um, vitamin D, as you may know, is, is largely entirely produced in the skin in response to sunlight. Uh, there's very little vitamin D in a normal diet. Um, but the sarcoid granulomas, which are these collections of inflammatory cells, have a tendency, for reasons that we don't know, to overproduce the active form of vitamin D, which can drive up calcium levels, sometimes to dangerously high uh, levels. And taking a, too much additional vitamin D as supplements could make that worse. So if you, generally speaking, if you're a sarcoidosis patient, I would be very cautious about taking vitamin D supplements. Now, the high vitamin D and the high calcium does not affect 
every patient with sarcoidosis by any means, but it can afflict some. Uh, people with sarcoidosis who run, run into trouble with high calcium levels tend to do so in the sunny months, again, because they're producing more vitamin D in their skin in the sunshine, so it tends to be worse in the summer or when people go on holiday. Um, so it's just something to be very cautious about. Does vitamin D have a health benefit in terms of protection against COVID? Uh, we don't know that. Uh, vitamin D is an important hormone for bone health. Um, it has been proposed to have lots of other benefits in lots of other conditions, most of which are unproven. So my, uh, my advice for most people is, um, is to eat a healthy diet, um, to get just the right amount of sunshine. If you're, a bit, if you're a sarcoid patient with high calcium levels, then you should avoid excessive sunlight. Uh, but healthy diet and healthy living, taking plenty of exercise, um, it would be the best advice for most people. And um, what does high level, what, what's the impact of high levels of calcium? So people who suffer from high levels of calcium may cause uh, funny symptoms such as abdominal pain, uh, mental confusion, passing lots of urine. Uh, its main uh, toxicity or its main problem is that it tends to um, affect the kidneys. So you can imagine that the high calcium in the blood gets filtered out by the kidneys because that's what the kidneys do and then tends to clog up uh, the kidneys. So uh, kidney problems uh, can occur as a result of high calcium levels. So it's just something to be aware of um, in sarcoidosis. It only affects some people with sarcoidosis, but you wouldn't want to uh, precipitate or make a, make a calcium level worse, especially uh, by overdoing it with vitamin D supplements. Now there's a bit of a balance to be had there because for example, if, if you're a sarcoidosis patient on steroid therapy with prednisolone, one of the problems with steroids in the longer term is that they can make the bones weaker. So we want to, we want to optimize bone health if you're on steroid therapy, uh, but you've got to balance that against the risks of pushing the calcium levels too high. If you're worried about your calcium level or you don't know whether you should be, it's measured as part of a routine uh, biochemical blood test. So if you've ever had uh, a, a standard blood test done, uh, the serum calcium level should be part of that. So you should be able to find out what your calcium level has been. And um, the person also asked about K2, um, which is uh, um, the vitamin K2, and not the synthetic cannabinoid. <laughs> I first googled as what came up. Um, 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 yeah. <laughs> Do you have any comments on that either? Well, vi <laughs> vitamin K is, uh, is important for, for blood clotting and it's a fat soluble vitamin. So unless you don't absorb fat because you've got a gut problem, like you've got cystic fibrosis or something, uh, you, sh you, you should be okay in, in terms of vitamin K levels. Fair enough. Great. And that was for Cardenas on Facebook. Thank you for that question. And we, we, we've also, we've started to get some, which some nice questions, some nice just People saying hello to you, uh, and uh, um, someone on Facebook has said, my husband is under your care, uh, and uh, I can't thank you enough for your care of him. And, uh, it's, it, it's, it's nice to have that feedback, thank you. That's all right, there's a few coming in, I'll, I'll, I'll clip to them every now and again, but it's uh, you know, if, if anyone has any nice comments, they're always, it's always lovely to see. Um, right, we've got work to do, none of this nice chit chat, being kind and generous, and talking about all the great things you do. Um, it's, no, You're going into right Jeremy Paxman mode now, are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm clearly, clearly a part of it. You know, while the seat's empty, so, you know, he's retired. <laughs> Let's go for it. Um, I think we've, if anyone has more uh, COVID questions, that, that's our lot for, for now. Um, we're going to move into some more sort of general questions um, focused. Um, uh, we're going to start with medication. Uh, then we have a section on symptoms and side, side effects, uh, um, uh, exercise in general. Um, why? Um, so someone. Uh, so we've had a question in saying, um, 
why was my consultant reluctant to prescribe any medication to me when I was first um, diagnosed with sarcoidosis of um, the, the mediastinal lymph nodes um, and uh, asking about their ACE level? Uh, and they've mentioned a specific number, 137. Would you consider that a flag for further investigation? Yeah. Well, I think this, this question is, uh, raises an important uh, point about um, how, how, how to best manage people with sarcoidosis, Henry. So I think this is a, a good question to, to start with on kind of the treatment section. Um, it is true, of course, and we may come on to this later, that we don't understand the cause of sarcoidosis, but we do understand, what we do understand is, is quite a lot about how it behaves and what to do about it and what not to do about it. Now, for many, and actually probably the majority of people who, who are first diagnosed with sarcoidosis, if you leave it alone, it will behave itself. So an initial uh, management plan of a period of observation without treatment is entirely appropriate for most people. And that is because the sarcoidosis, after it first appears, will often resolve by itself, maybe not completely, partially resolve or appear to be self-resolving and not cause too much of a problem. And if you like, uh, be there in balance or in harmony with the immune system. In sarcoidosis, something seems to be driving uh, the immune response that leads to the formation of these granulomas, which are collections of immune cells in various uh, parts of the body. And it seems to get into balance with itself. So it's that the granulomas are there and the sarcoidosis is still there. It's not completely gone away, but it's not causing any huge problem in terms of symptoms or any danger to health or life. And in that situation, given the fact that we don't have a cure, we don't have a treatment that will make it go away, uh, the best thing to do, if possible, is to leave it alone and adopt a period of active monitoring. And, you know, so in, a, in our outpatient clinic, that might involve uh, a chest X-ray every now and then or some lung function tests every now and then. And that is entirely the appropriate thing to do. Interestingly, if, if you have the sarcoidosis that appears very acutely, and by that I mean appears fairly quickly, and that's usually over several weeks, um, and if you read the textbooks or um, look it up on the internet, uh, it's often referred to as Lofgren's syndrome, uh, named after the Scandinavian physician who first described it. The Scandinavians seem to have a lot of sarcoidosis. So in Sweden, for example, it's very common. Um, and they see a lot of this acute sarcoidosis that comes on very quickly. And if it comes on very quickly like that, it will usually, in the vast majority of cases, resolve by itself if you leave it alone. So that very acute sarcoidosis has the best prognosis in terms of getting better by itself. If the sarcoidosis gets diagnosed and it's actually been grumbling in the background um, without being noticed for, for several years, and that is the case sometimes, then it's less likely to resolve by itself, but is still best treated with a period of observation, if possible, as long as there's nothing dangerous there about it. So that's my general comments on um, how to best uh, initially manage people with sarcoidosis. And, and the other point there, you know, so I said there's no cure for it. And the other treatments that we have, the steroids and the immune suppressive drugs, they're not curative treatments. These are just treatments that suppress that immune response and suppress the granulomas whilst people are on treatment. And that may be beneficial for people, but of course, these drugs have potential side effects and adverse effects as well. So it's important to weigh up between the clinician and the patient uh, whether treatment is really needed or whether it may be better to be on no treatment. So that's, that's uh, addressing that point. And then the other part of this question was about the serum ACE level or the serum ACE activity. Uh, so that stands for the angiotensin converting enzyme. And it's another one of these things, a bit like the calcium, really, that goes up in people with sarcoidosis for reasons that we're not entirely clear about. But again, it seems to be produced by the immune cells in these granulomas. And so you can measure it in the blood test as a marker of sarcoidosis activity, if you like, how much of these, how many of these granulomas are churning out the ACE. The ACE, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't 
matter what it is. It doesn't have a physiological consequence. It's just something that you can measure in the blood as a marker of sarcoidosis. Um, but it's of limited usefulness. So we do tend to measure it, and um, I'm as guilty as many other physicians of, of measuring it in my patients. Um, but sometimes it's more interesting than practically useful because, like I say, even if your sarcoidosis seems to get better and seems to behave itself, it often still grumbles a little bit there in the background. And so if you measure something like the serum ACE, it may still be elevated. Um, so our questioner here had a serum ACE of around 130, which is probably about twice the upper limit of normal. Uh, it may still run high, but if it's not causing any problem, uh, that, that wouldn't be any reason to intervene. So um, from what I can tell from this question, um, uh, the, the, way, the way the person was managed here would probably be similar to the way that, that I would recommend managing it. And I think that's an important point, that it's the discussion with a, with a lot more detail between a clinician uh, yeah. and, the, and their patient. Um, on a similar sort of discussion of, uh, of treatment and, and, um, uh, and looking into the disease, um, uh, uh, Michael on Facebook has said, it's common to, is it common to have a repeated um, PET scan after a period of treatment to see uh, if sarcoidosis has improved or if it's spread further? Uh, interesting question. So for those who don't know, a PET scan is a type of uh, radionuclide medical imaging scan that uses a label, a radio labeled version of glucose. So the basic sugar uh, that's used for energy in the body. Uh, you get an injection of that, and then you get a scan to see which parts of the body are using lots of glucose or lots of energy. And interestingly, these scans were originally uh, developed to look at inflammation in the nervous system. So they were look, designed to look at neuroinflammation, but really they became in, uh, they came into widespread use in clinical practice for cancer staging because cancer tissue tends to use lots of energy and show up on a PET scan as well. But PET scans can be useful in people with sarcoidosis because the, the, the sarcoidosis granulomas also use lots of energy and will light up on a PET scan. So you can see uh, which parts of the body are affected. Um, we don't do a PET scan on all people with sarcoidosis uh, routinely, that's, that's not necessary. So we tend to use it selectively. Remember that it is a test that uses radiation. And whilst most types of medical imaging that use radiation, the dose is very small, um, it's a little bit higher for a PET scan, but it's not the sort of thing you want to undertake repeatedly unless there was a very good reason for it. And sometimes we do repeat it, um, especially if there seems to be a failure to response to treatment. Um, or if a person has symptoms that are not entirely in keeping with how much sarcoidosis there appears to be left behind, you can actually look at that more closely. So we use it selectively, but not routinely. It is a radiation dose involved in having a PET scan. Um, and, uh, and, and often, often in the hospitals, they are prioritized for people for cancer staging. But uh, we can and do do PET scans selectively and occasionally repeatedly, but not needed for the majority of people. I want to just like, it is fantastic that you can see that the, the, the fact you're also a teacher as well as a, a clinician. Because that explanation was fantastic. And uh, um, I really enjoyed it. it was very useful. Well, I think uh, medical imaging is quite an exciting area at the moment as well. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm enthused by medical imaging. And the beauty of, um, so for PET, for example, currently we use a, a, they use a, a radio label of glucose, but there's the great potential in the future of using uh, any sort of tracer that could look at any function in any part of the body. You just put a radio label on it and you could, you could potentially uh, look at, anything that you liked. Um, so, so certain types of medical imaging, including PET, have great potential in the future to, to look at specific things for all sorts of uh, different diseases. So it really is quite an exciting area that will undoubtedly uh, develop pretty quickly over the next few years. I look forward to getting your research application. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
Um, what, what, I would add, what I would add, uh, Henry, is, is that uh, for people with suspected cardiac, that is heart sarcoidosis, a PET scan is, is part of the standard workup. So uh, whilst I said most people wouldn't need one, um, for suspected cardiac sarcoidosis, it's uh, commonly done. And cardiac, as this is one of the, obviously the charity's big points, is cardiac sarcoidosis is um, much more prevalent than people historically had, had thought. Uh, and it is very important to have that, uh, well, an initial review to see if you need to go through and, and have, have further reviews because the, it is also one of the areas which is more likely to um, cause or have mortality issues that people might, yeah, might die. Yeah, that's correct. And our cu current recommendations are that um, as part of your initial um, tests that you have done, if you have sarcoidosis, is uh, to have a simple ECG an electrocardiogram and if that's normal and there are no other symptoms suggestive of cardiac sarcoidosis then that's fine you don't need to take it any further so that recommendation is uh, will appear in the hopefully soon to be published uh, British Thoracic Society clinical statement on diagnosis and management of cardiac sarcoidosis which which will help and guide healthcare professionals in how to best look after people with sarcoidosis. So we're hoping that that will be published um, maybe by the end of the year. And I, I, I obviously already love you. I love you even more for mentioning that because that's something that uh, uh, Sarcoidosis UK is involved with in the, in the background. And, uh, um, uh, and uh, it's a good example, actually, of something that, that charities do, which, you know, we, we, we work very hard on or involved with. and. Uh, it's obviously being led by the British Thoracic Society, but it is something that we're uh, involved in, and, uh, and you don't get to shout about it very much. But it's a lot of work all the way along, <laughs> and uh, uh, is incredibly important. So, what a statement is for people um, watching is is actually a description of how something should be treated. Uh, it is the same sort of uh, in the same way that um, uh, uh, Doctor Hart is a reader. <laughs> that, that is what he reads. <laughs> um, that works quite well, doesn't it? Like, I have no idea if it's in any way related. But like the statement is a, a, a very long discussed format of like what should be done. And, uh, and yeah. so obviously it can't be completely prescriptive, particularly when sarcoidosis is still not fully understood. Um, but the aim is obviously they get more and more prescriptive and understood over time. You're absolutely right, Henry. And, and one of the things that's emphasised in that clinical statement uh, is and for the reason that you you, you quite correctly state that that uh, for many of the approaches we're not that there's not a one size fits all or best a uh, best approach for everybody that there, there's a uh, a liaison and a discussion between the clinician and patient about how they would like to approach the diagnostic workup should they or should not should they not have a biopsy for example and then the same sort of discussion for weighing up the pros and cons of treatment versus no treatment, and then if it's treatment, which option to choose. And that's emphasised um, quite strongly in this clinical statement. So hopefully the patient involvement in, uh, in the diagnosis and, and treatment plan um, will become more prominent as a result of this statement. Yeah, well, we think it's very important because we, yeah. like, we do obviously know of people who, who have passed who may not have needed to because they didn't have an intervention uh, because nothing was picked up because there wasn't a um, look, there wasn't a, any investigation to, into that cardiac yeah. side and that's a part of the, the development here um, and this is also to say is, is a step on uh, uh, um, on the road actually to a, to a, um, a clinical standard uh, so the world um, sarcoidosis organization WASOG uh, is um, setting up a clinical standard which this cardiac statement is fed into and once the statement has been done, that then enables there to be a clinical standard, which is what happens, what is a sarcoidosis clinic, what happens in it. And the part of what happens yeah. in it is this cardiac re review. Uh, and that, that is what's happening next. And then once we have that, uh, we'll then be obviously pressuring and working with the NHS to set these up uh, across the UK. So we have specialist sarcoidosis clinics, which are, are to a, a standard that has been agreed amongst clinicians such as yourself, the eminent sarcoidosis clinicians around, around the world. Very good. Um, uh, and I, I think it's important amongst this to show that, you know, that, that that sort of longer arc of work uh, that you're part of 
uh, which is to develop and progress the understanding of sarcoidosis and, and how that understanding is implemented, uh, because the, the two are, are needed. Right, we have questions and uh, not so much time. Um, uh, we had, um, there have been a lot of people worried with just about, am I more vulnerable? Uh, um, we also had a, a question sent in, am I more vulnerable to catching or picking things up because I'm on planisarone or infleximab? Yeah, so this is uh, the, the, the downside of taking any sort of immune suppressive therapy such as steroids or some of the other immunosuppressants and or a drug like infliximab or its relatives which suppress the chemical mediator called TNF which seems to be key in in driving granuloma formation. So all of these drugs deliberately suppress these, these processes, um, but a down, so but increased infection risk uh, is a general downside of each or all of these medications. So the answer is yes, if you're taking these medications, you are generally more vulnerable to infection compared with if you weren't. Um, but again, a bit like the a bit like the COVID. Uh, shielding discussion, um, you know, th th there is a little bit of risk there, but, you know, uh, just taking sensible precautions, hand washing, avoid, uh, avoiding contact with people who uh, uh, have coughs and cold. I guess that's that's more acceptable nowadays to keep away from uh, people with coughs and colds than, than it was pre-COVID. So sensible uh, general advice, um, but it is, it is a downside of taking one or more of these medications. True. Any, any impact with um, COVID? Um, again, uh, for even including infliximab, um, no real clinical experience that there's increased risk of uh, COVID with that drug. But given the fact it's, it, it's a rarely used uh, drug, although it is used uh, for some people with rheumatoid and Crohn's disease as well as sarcoidosis, um, there probably aren't enough people taking it for us to be able to get good data about that. We had some questions on symptoms and side effects. Yeah. Like, now this one, this one definitely uh, uh, um, worries me. Josephine um, uh, uh, messaging, like, is pain in your chest and ribs common? No, it shouldn't be. Um, that... Pain in your chest, just that sets off an alarm bell for me. Well, because it may, well, absolutely right. When people talk about chest pain, if you phone NHS 111 and say you've got chest pain, they will call an ambulance for you because obviously heart related pain, if someone's having a heart attack or a bad angina attack, it occurs in the chest. Um, of course, most people who come to hospital with chest pain, it's not a heart attack or anything to do with their heart. It comes from somewhere else. So the, the parts of your, uh, your thorax, which can, which can lead to pain as well as your heart, would include uh, obviously anything in the chest wall. So that's ribs, muscles, uh, joints. Uh, it can come from the spine. If you have uh, problems with your spine, it, the pain can get referred around the side. The esophagus, so the food pipe, uh, can cause pain in the chest, which can sometimes mimic a heart attack if the esophagus is inflamed and goes into spasm, that can cause pain that mimics a heart attack. Um, and in terms of when it comes to the lungs, there are no pain nerves actually in the lungs themselves, but there are around the outside, uh, around the inner lining of the uh, inside of the ribs. And uh, that can lead to pain that tends to be very sharp. Uh, you can always put your finger on exactly where it is and tends to be worse when you breathe in. So that's a pleurisy type pain. Um, it's difficult to know from the, from the question uh, what exactly the person's suffering from, but chest and ribs. So a, you know, a common scenario where we'd see people with that sort of pain would be people who cough a lot. So if you cough a lot, you can get quite a bit of uh, chest wall pain as a result of the strain put on the, uh, the ribs, etc. as a result of coughing. But I think the, so the summary is uh, it, it could be nothing but also could be something you yeah obviously, obviously, that, obviously that obviously that's something that you'd want to speak to your doctor about. yeah but otherwise it can it can yeah happen and be uh, not not critical but um just yeah. in just in case um 
I'm aware that um, uh, uh, sadly our clock is ticking down. I'm not. Yeah, you better, asked, you better pick pick the key questions. Henry. Yeah, I've not asked about your. I mean, what they all the they're, we're always picking the key questions. Um, the, um, but I need to ask you about research. So Jackie, yeah. the fabulous Jackie, which pretty much a lot of people who will know through Facebook, uh, has asked. Um, uh, has your research on the sarcoid immune response been published yet? And how is your sarcoid mTOR research going? I think she's got a, that's a solid question. We've got, uh, thank you for the question. So this is the research that, as uh, Henry mentioned, has been funded by uh, Sarcoidosis by UK. Yeah, which really has been funded by people watching here. And yeah, exactly. that's it, your, uh, your fundraising. Um, so we've got- And everything else, like it's, uh, you know, this is where the money goes, yeah. Two, two papers have currently been submitted for publication and are kind of going through the rounds of revision at the moment. So very much have, hope to have those out by the end of the year. Um, so, of course, we don't have time just at the moment to talk about all the results there. Yeah, and I but... want to inter interject. Now, one of the sadnesses about medical research is like it, 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 you can't talk about the results until it's been peer reviewed and published. And that's the, 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 part the, of the frustration is that it, it is, and that's part of the publication process. And the copyright for that then get, gets transferred to the journal. And so the journals are often unhappy if you uh, pre publish uh, results without their knowledge. But we're, we will be publishing the, some of the immune uh, response work. We are going to publish some initial results from the azithromycin trial in terms of its effect on cough. Um, and the mTOR work related to that has a, a slightly fallen foul of COVID because uh, we have a, a freezer full of samples waiting to be analysed. Mm. But because of COVID and the fact that the university laboratories shut down uh, for a period of time, we have not been able to analyse them yet. So they're all there, ready to be analysed. We just need to uh, work out how we're going to do that. So there will be more results forthcoming from that. And I assume um, not the shutdown, but also those people who were involved, I imagine, also got involved with some of the work in doing, in doing analysis. And maybe, maybe absolutely absolutely that, correct. Yeah. So, so in terms of personnel to do it, that's been a challenge uh, during COVID as well. OK, but the samples are there and it's, it's just waiting for that analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so two, two papers shortly and then there'll be more coming after that. So it's, you know, there's there's a delay between when the research is funded and done and when we can get the results out, which is which is unfortunately inevitable as part of the uh, the, the scientific rigour of the uh, publication process. And it's a part of the success of the scientific method that because things yeah. have been peer reviewed and and uh, and uh, considered to, to be um, moving on knowledge in a in an important way. Um, so then people can then use it as the basis of the next step of research. And, and that's Correct. how we build up and up and up. And, uh, yep. and although it, it can feel a bit frustrating, it is, um, it is very, very important. Uh, and, uh, and actually what we've been seeing as an interesting side note with COVID is the, the acceleration of that process with the specific regards for uh, corona, coronavirus. Very much so. It's, it's been incredible, actually. Yeah. Yeah. But which in turn, though, has... Uh, um, and I, I know this is something that Jackie has, has, has raised, and you're not, you don't need to answer on this. But she's then you're worried about like what happens, say for instance, if a vaccine comes out, and for people with sarcoidosis, what is the, has that been understood? If there's going to be an impact there, or, there or not? And is there is a risk with keeping an, an eye on, but it's obviously far. There is a risk. Thing. There is a risk with rushing things through. You are correct. Yeah, and so that yeah. we are. The, yeah, that balance is something that, we, that that is obviously due to the what's happening is has changed. But um, I mean, that's uh, so that's um, uh, this. So we've got two minutes left. That's, that's uh, very um, tough. So, um, what uh, what are you focused on on next? So, what do you where do you want to progress things to next? Like, where does the future lie in terms of well, to heart and sarcoidosis? I think, um, you know, so there are some, some questions we haven't had a chance to address. And one of them is about, you know, are we closer to finding a cure for sarcoidosis? And I, I think that's going to that's gonna depend on finding the cause. So the elusive cause or causes of sarcoidosis. And there are a lot of, you know, uh, 
I think psychoanalysis research has become more prominent um, from, from having been the poor relation for a long period of time with the work of uh, Psychoanalysis UK and other charities has become more prominent the more people are working on it. So, so hopefully in terms of finding out what it is that and it, it triggers and drives sarcoidosis. And only when we understand that, I think, are we going to be able to find a cure, um, unless we get really lucky and find something by chance that works. And, and indeed, that has happened in other, in other conditions. So um, you can't rule that out, but that's leaving a little bit to luck and chance um, rather than proper understanding of the biology. So we've, we, you know, we, we are, so for example, as a, as a, as a bit of research that we're uh, looking at doing at the moment is, is, uh, uh, is trying to understand more about the biology of sarcoidosis from biopsy samples that people have, applying state-of-the-art technology that can look at hundreds of genes or hundreds of proteins in different bits of a biopsy uh, all at the same time. And hopefully that sort of work will just put more information out there that will give us some clues about uh, what it is that's driving sarcoidosis. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it has been, I, I found it absolutely fascinating and uh, um, very interesting and um, I, particularly good your teacher side coming out and explaining things with such clarity uh, is fantastic. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Harry. It's, it's been an absolute pleasure. And, and time flies. The hour has gone far, very fast, hasn't it? And it's, I'm sorry we haven't managed to get to all of the questions, but hopefully we've got to uh, enough of the important questions that uh, that, that uh, people will be um, will be interested and, and happy with what we've discussed today. And uh, for everyone watching, do keep an eye on our um, social media and we'll announce more of these as they come up. We will probably try and answer some of these questions, anything that was missed then. and. Uh, as well as obviously new ones. Um, uh, and well, look, uh, it just leaves me to say thank you again to Dr. Hart. Thank you for your time. Thank you for all you're doing, uh, both as uh, on the research and the, and the, and the clinical side. Um, it's all hugely appreciated. And thank you for the, your support of uh, Sarcoidosis UK. You're on our uh, part of the clinical board, uh, helping us make uh, those, this, those important decisions as a charity. Um, and uh, I think I'll just thank you again. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Henry, and, and thanks to Sarcoidosis UK and all the fundraisers who've, who've made our research possible. Absolutely, and that does leave me to do the, the final part, which uh, every good chairperson has to do, which is uh, uh, to say, obviously, look, we can do nothing. We get no government funding, not, not, a, not, a, not a penny. Uh, we can do nothing without your support and your, your help. And uh, uh, fundraising now is very, very tough. Like every charity, we've seen a massive decline, but we, we don't want to stop doing the, uh, anything that we're doing. You know, we're providing support, information, uh, funding important research like uh, uh, Dr. Hart's. Dr. Hart is actually the only person for whom we funded two pieces of research. Uh, and obviously we want to do, do more. Uh, and uh, uh, all very important and focused on that, that, that last question, that last part, which is finding, that, finding a cure. Thank you for watching. Do keep an eye out. To, uh, join our newsletter uh, to see what we're up to. Follow us on social media to um, uh, be up to the latest on what we're doing and uh, what is happening in the sarcoidosis community. Thank you for watching. Thank you again, Dr. Hart. Uh, and uh, to say goodbye to everyone and look forward to seeing you next time. Bye-bye. Uh,